Thanks, everyone. Um, my name's Troy Whitaker. Uh, I'm the Managing Director uh, of Whitecliffe, Whitecliffe Minerals. Um, we'll whistle stop through this today, uh, given we've only got 15 uh, odd minutes. Um, key people for us, uh, Rod McElroy, you would have seen floating around uh, as well. Rod's an Australian based geologist based in, in London. Um, he has uh, more than 20, 25 years based in frontier exploration. Our projects are in the north of Canada. Uh, having someone like Rod, who's operated in, in Greenland, in Finland, um, that Arctic region uh, is an exceptional uh, a, a advantage for us. Um, similar with, with Eric Sundergaard, uh, Eric lives in Canada, uh, in Alberta there. So he's our boots on the ground uh, for these projects. Similar to Rod, uh, plenty of frontier experience uh, in, the, in the, the Nether regions. Um, Dan Smith, uh, down there with me in Perth, my background. Um, I worked for Fortescue Metals Group for about eight or so years. Um, I ran their commercial team when they built uh, T155. So that was all of the upgrades from Christmas Creek, Solomon, North Star, Port Rail. Um, after that, uh, I looked after that team, which ran their C1 cost initiatives, initiative, sorry, um, which brought it from 70 on the boat uh, down to about 15. Um, so we're going to skip through to, you know, what is Whitecliffe uh, and why people are currently investing in Whitecliffe. This journey started about 12 months ago. Um, Rod was the first one uh, onto the board of Whitecliffe. Um, they have a, a history uh, like uh, most on the ASX, um, Nickel, uh, Rare Earth. Um, we saw it as, you know, a company with a good shareholder base, um, some decent projects. Um, but something that certainly we could, you know, start to put in uh, some really exciting projects. So in uh, November uh, and December of last year, we acquired the Ray Copper project uh, up there in Nunavut. Uh, in January, uh, we acquired the, the Great Bear project uh, in the Northwest Territories. Um, and when I say acquired, uh, those were staked uh, and brought organically. Um, there's no vent for these. There's no trailing royalty. Um, they are 100% owned. Um, and being in Canada, you know, I'm certainly seeing it as a jurisdiction that really wants to promote mining. So we picked up those projects in April, May of this year. We had our maiden targets identified. We had our maiden uh, exploration campaign commenced. So if you think about other jurisdictions in the world that actually promote that, um, it, is tr it is starting to get pretty skinny. We've now had some of our results starting to come through. Um, and all of that has generated, you know, quite a bit of momentum, uh, quite a bit of excitement. Um, you know, the shareholder base uh, of Whitecliffe, you know, when we took over, was about six and a half thousand individual shareholders. Um, now we've cleaned that up to about two and a half thousand. So people like myself, people like Rod, Eric, Dan, um, every opportunity we've got, you know, we, we see that this, this project has huge potential. We've been buying. Um, as of last week, uh, we released our top 20 shareholders uh, a guy by the name of john hancock uh, has been buying on market uh, john's the son of, of gina um just recently we've now appointed him as a strategic advisor uh, to the board as well so you know everything is starting to take shape um so our two projects um you know we've based ourselves out of yellowknife uh, yellowknife is the capital uh, of the northwest territories it's about an hour and a half commercial jet from vancouver um, Yellowknife does have, uh, sorry, commercial flights from all major cities um, going to it. You know, it. It provides us with a real industrial hub. Um, what I've seen from Yellowknife, you know, it, it's not as big as a Port Hedland or a Kalgoorlie, um, but you know, the infrastructure is there, mining services are there, mining contractors are there, consultants are there, warehousing. Having an ability to base and stage, draw on resources, um, Yellowknife gives us that real foundation uh, to do so. So the first of our projects, uh, Great Bear, um, it is only an hour and a half flight uh, in a Dash 7 uh, to our own airstrip. Uh, and I think that's what sort of sets us apart. At both projects, we have the ability to land an airstrip, sorry, to land a Dash 7 and be bang there uh, on site. Similarly, uh, at Ray, again, that's probably about two hours uh, in a Dash 7, but we can land right at the actual site itself and deploy people straight into the field. Benefit of Ray is it's only about 70 kilometres uh, from the town of, of Kubutuk. This is a, a very small town, but again, you know, it sort of adds to, to the infrastructure piece that we have available to us. 
It has a port that's available six, seven, eight months of the year, uh, breakwater, uh, a town which has two or three general stores, accommodation, messing. Um, so in terms of you know, the ability to, to stage people, house people, um, to support exploration campaigns at both, um, we're in a pretty fertile area. So starting with, with Great Bear, um, Great Bear is an area that was founded uh, in the 1900s uh, by the Geological State Survey. It was a uh, geologist walking along, mapping, you know, no particular interest in what minerals were in the ground. However, they found some fairly high grade minerals, which resulted in mining actually commencing uh, in that area in about the 1930s. Um, there was a real focus on uranium and silver, uh, and silver uh, based on uh, fluctuating uh, prices. But you know, what we have seen is there was a real ignorance as to what the potential value was in gold uh, and copper. So whilst there was some copper produced, the focus was really on uranium uh, and silver. The area itself uh, lies in the Great Bear Magmatic Zone. Um, and what you'll see if I just ping back is that there has been lots of exploration in the south. That zone uh, extends right up past us in, uh, at Port Radium and out into the east. Exploration has really started to commence from Yellowknife upwards, um, and it has been identified as having the highest probability um, for IOCG mineralization in Canada in its entirety. Um, and there is two particular deposits um, in the uh, west, east of uh, Yellowknife there uh, held by Fortune Minerals. So in terms of our uh, 2028 field campaign, uh, you can see up there in the top, there's three mines, the old Echo Bay, El Dorado, that's where they, they mined uh, uranium from. Our real focus with this particular campaign was to start where we can get in, where there's infrastructure, um, and start to chase outcropping. Um, we understand the mineralization around those historic mines, but what we don't understand is the mineralization that was found uh, by the state survey. So the team had a very clear goal as to get out onto the field uh, and start to look at how they could extend those strikes. Um, with taking real uh, snapshots of what that mineralization is. So I'll focus on two for the purposes today. This is a target that we could walk to from, from our airport. Um, and as you can see, you know, they've managed to walk across uh, more than three kilometer strike in an east-west direction um, and also two. So you, you're starting to form an area that has real scale. Um, and I know that you know, these are only rock chips, but you know, these are rock chips that we've put, picked up um, over a really substantial distance. And when you're talking about 40% copper, 40% copper, you know, with, with good decent gold at three and a half grams a tonne, up to 180 grams a tonne of silver, you know, you've got fairly fertile ground with a portfolio that looks something like Olympic Dam minus the uranium. Going down to, to slider, this, this is a, a really interesting target. So down here is where or um, the production of, of silver uh, at the Bonanza Silver Mine. We've managed to trace uh, a geological structure uh, across the lake and they never actually came that way because it, whilst it was a shallow mine, they never came under the lake. A regional fault about one and a half kilometers east-west, there seems to be something that, that goes north-south as well. So you've got an area that is quite, you know, it's a substantial area. What we did was sampled the three points of the triangle and the grades we got back in silver, I'm yet to see anyone get any higher than us. Um, at 7.5%, 5.5%, when you're talking percentage silver, you're in a complete different ballpark to anyone. So having grades come out the ground like that across a distance, this here really has the potential to be something that you know, can, can formulate into something world class. I'm just going to skip through some of these so we can talk about Ray. This one here, I'll pause on very briefly. This particular structure um, is a collapse feature, and this is what the Fortune Minerals had been targeting down to the east of Yellowknife. Um, you can see there, everything seems to form in on each other. We focused on uh, mineralization at the north, and again, you know, you're looking at really good grades gold, really good grades copper. Um, but I think for us, looking at that particular feature versus you know, some of the regional um, structures. If you look just below the Cody target, again, there's, there's a really significant structure here. So whilst we were out in the field running this campaign around grab samples, 
it was supported across the entire project by geophysics. So between this uh, and the Ray project, uh, it's probably you know, the single biggest campaign run by a singular company in Canada uh, for a period of time. So I'll just move forward to, to Ray now. <clears throat> so Ray is 70 kilometres um, uh, west of Kukutuk. Um, it's an area that came to the fruition about in the 17th, 17th century, um, all the way from Kukutuk up the Copper Mine River along this, this Ray uh, group structure um, is native copper occurrences. Um, and ex early explorers actually identified the Inuits and they had tools, weapons, idols, and that's what brought them to the area. Interestingly, uh, in about 2000s, um, Robert Friedland picked up this ground. This is actually his. He started a campaign drilling in that sedimentary structure every couple of kilometres, 12 holes right up into our border. At our border, he finally hit copper. 30 metres at 0.6%, included two high grade zones of six metres and three metres percent. Now, that's not a mine in its own right, but you're now approaching something. The smartest people in the room when it comes to copper had this ground, were chasing it and found something. Unfortunately, in 2015, there was a, a real upheaval of the land use agreement, how you interacted uh, with the local units, and effectively, everything was all stopped. Mining, exploration, none of it came to a grounding halt. Um, and what appeared for, for seven, eight years, there was just no resolution in sight. Um, and so that particular company got frustrated and they dropped it. In about 2022, uh, Eric, uh, our Canadian-based director, um, was spending a little bit of time in the mines department because um, he gets bored and spends time in the mines department. We do judge him for that. But he managed to, he came across these results. So he was keeping an eye on this particular project. Um, when it became apparent where there was a light at the end of the tunnel for the land use agreement, we went and staked this and it was approved. So now we're sitting in an environment whereby there's a land use agreement in place, there's a program of work, that, or there's, a, there's a program of engagement to engage with Inuits, there's compensation around that, um, and that's why we had our claims approved in Q1 of this year, and we've actually got out into the field with results coming through. So sedimentary hosted copper, Everyone knows what that means. It means big, big tons. 20 to 30% of copper comes out of sedimentary hosted copper. Zambia, African copper belt, you know, it's massive. If you were to put a five kilometer radius around anywhere in that particular zone, you're probably gonna pick up three or four of the mines. We know this particular area, or this, this particular sediment, it clusters. They've chased it all the way to our doorstep. They finally found it, dropped it, and we've got it. That initial eastern section of our uh, license is a 16 kilometer basin. Perfect place for copper to accumulate. We've run geophysics over all of this area. And if there is a conductive anomaly which sits there, it could get exciting pretty quickly. To add to that, we, if you've come across to, to our booth, you would have seen um, the, the richest of copper bearing minerals, the, the chalcosite, which sits at about 80% by weight, bornite 60%, that's all outcropping at surface. We sat in a helicopter and chased copper strike. You just don't do that, outcropping green. Um, I've done that for iron ore. I, I have never done it for copper and I've never heard anyone talk about it doing it for copper. So, you know, we know this is a particularly fertile area. We haven't got the assays back for what's on my desk at the moment. But if you're thinking it's a mixture of 80%, 60% and 30%, this, this might blow the Great Bear copper results away, which were 42%. Um, that particular strike that you see there had uh, a small campaign done back in, I think it was uh, 1950s. They put 10 shallow drill holes on 10 metres uh, and they declared a resource of 100,000 tonnes at 9%. Now, again, that is low side, but that demonstrates what is particularly fertile ground. You know the copper's there. It's from the same, uh, sorry, the, the sedimentary structure in this particular area was actually created at the same time as the African copper belt. So you know at that point, copper things were running wild and we're sitting on this ground where you can see it, feel it, touch it. The next couple of weeks will be, will be fairly big for us. We should see the assays from Ray coming through in the next seven to 10 days. Um, I think that will be you know, a real kick for us. Um, as I say, I'm expecting to, to go well in excess of what we saw at Great Bear. 
Then the geophysical surveys come in. You know, what lies beneath? We're now going to have a real understanding of what sits at surface, um, how that correlates, what that geophysical signature looks like at surface, and if it extends underground, as I say, there's, it could get really exciting for us uh, very, very quickly. So we expect those to come out October through November. That will then allow us to talk about, you know, when we're drilling and how we're drilling. All the information will be in front of us. Um, coming out in November, it's probably too close to Christmas to put a team into the field. Um, being efficient, I'm sure everyone would agree there. So come Q1, we'll start to mobilise those drillers to site um, for that maiden campaign. So real productive news flow. Uh, from here all the way through to middle of next year when we're seeing assays. Any questions? I'm over at booth 13, just behind the yellow rock team, so please come and see me. Thank you.